Hi, welcome. I'm Andrew Gall. In, this is one of a series of discussions with executives who are leading strategic change, innovation and venturing. In the live sessions, uh, we have questions and in-depth discussions with senior peers uh, during this session. We have now edited out those sort of discussions for confidentiality of those participants. The resources and podcasts are available uh, with videos on the Aim of Our Resources website. Please enjoy, make comments and do get in touch. Thank you. And the main topic of today's um, session is around the role of directors and the legal aspects as we, as we go through sort of this pandemic as ventures are running out of cash as corporates are considering you know how their venture funds work and how how your individual venture funds and that work um, neil who's been in this space about 20 years now um across life sciences been working corporate venture capital sort of uh, area uh, done deals with the likes of spacex tesla and some down-to-earth companies and that as well that we've got on the call and that here uh -huh. uh, and some interesting areas in plastics and recycling robotics uh, electric vehicles which i've done quite a bit on in the um, last number of months and i've had the pleasure of working with neil on a number of corporate venturing academies that i've uh, that i've run um and recently moved uh, to Brown and Rudnick and covering the global head of technology sector practice. So I haven't stolen too much of your introduction, Neil, but uh, hopefully teed up quite nicely for you to give a bit of context uh, from you before we get into questions on that. Absolutely. Um, Andrew, thanks ever so much for that. Um, yeah, that's that's most of the uh, the introduction that I was going to mention. Um, yeah. and, and Andrew um, is is also he was he was modest in his introduction of himself so i'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to andrew as well andrew's book that you'll see on his bookshelf behind him um purpose to performance the five p's of corporate venture capital i believe it might be um is an outstanding book and andrew is a consultant to corporate venture funds both on the structuring internally and also on um our, our, on internal reporting and uh, valuation and also assessing what is strategic uh, value which is so difficult to tell financial value much easier so i encourage you to follow up with, with andrew afterwards on, on that front so we've presented on a master's day uh masters of corporate venturing on this very topic of um, fiduciary duties directors roles best practice risks etc and actually, on those in happier days than we're going through at the moment, most of it was actually on on performance, um, coaching and enhancements and those types of things. Today, most of the questions that um, that we're given at the moment, and they are hourly, if not daily uh, at the moment, are on. Oh, crikey, I'm on a board and they're running out of cash and I'm not going to support them anymore. I'm an investor director. I'm being told by my by my um, by my employer one thing, but I've got to act in the best interest of the company. I know that whichever country in the world you're in, fiduciary duties are remarkably similar. I'll come on to that in, in a little bit. Um, and so you have conflicting uh, pressures. And so when Andrew and I were, were presenting uh, this type of topic, in the past it's it's been with a very different sort of flavor today i'm expecting the questions that you want to be uh, asked and the discussion to be had is well what about those conflicts of interest what about personal liability if i'm sitting on an english board which a number of you uh, will be does it does it change if i'm on an american board and maybe mark will be um um guiding us on on, on that topic as well um how does it differ if I'm uh, an observer? Should I be an observer? Should I be a director? Um, how am I indemnified? Am I indemnified? What about DNO insurance? All of those sorts of things are now questions that we're having on an hourly or daily basis at the moment. So let's start with the role. <laughs> the role is uh, for the investor director, as you know, is key. Not only are you uh, one vote on the board, but you're also a, a, a successful, experienced investor director, as a number of you are on this 
uh, on this call and the people that you work with. Um, and, you know, Tony Askew last uh, week was presenting on this. I've known Tony for about 20 years. He's been um, an investor director through those cycles. We've advised through those cycles. And um, the role is one of those that um, he said, to quote him from last week, the company can live or die by your decision. And an investor's reputation is made in the downturn. And Tony is absolutely right on that. The reputation of corporate venturers that head for the hills in the difficult times um, will stay with them. Those of us that are very active in this area, Andrew, me, Mark, Tim, etc., the rest of you, um, you'll remember who were there when you were co-investment investing and they were saying they're not going to invest. Um, now, there are very good reasons at the moment leading to some of those differing interests, which you have to manage as an investor director. So it's not a conflict of interest. Now, every director on a board has differing interests. A lot of people think that's a conflict of interest automatically. So a, a, a CEO is likely for a private company, private innovation uh, innovator, it's likely to be a shareholder, might be an option holder, um, might uh, uh, is going to be a director, is an employee. So where's what's that? Four hats could be more. An investor director, a non-exec chairman, might have some share options for private companies that I work with. You know, that on public companies, that might not be seen as best practice, but for private companies, that is very often the case. So that person will have, might have a consulting contract as well. So um, that's three differing interests. Differing interests don't make conflicts of interest, provided they are declared. And they are not, you're not self-dealing. You're not working on both sides of a transaction. You're not, um, you know, leasing the company your property at a higher value than you ought to be, that type of um, thing. But conflicts of interest, uh, differing interests need managing for you as investor directors. Because if your employer, Siri, Ant, et cetera, if your employer says, you've got to do this, um, when you're in a board meeting, you have to be mindful, obviously, that you're a human being and you can't not have that in your mind. But when you're making decisions in the board meeting, you have to make those decisions in the best interests of that portfolio company. Even though that portfolio company, you don't have a contract with that portfolio company and your boss tells you to do something. Um, but when you're in that meeting, you are, um, you are making those decisions in the best interests of the company. So there are differing interests and we all need to handle those. So those are a few opening remarks. And I've touched upon a whole load of things that we'll no doubt come back to. But um, Andrew, I'll hand back to you. Certainly reiterate some of the points that Neil has made. Um, one of the ones that might sort of ring a, ring a bell with, with Paul, I'm an angel investor in a, in a tech, bit, tech uh, materials business. Uh, and I invested well, probably something like 10 years ago in that, that now, if not more, done three rounds and that with it. And we had one of the investment rounds where the corporate decided they weren't going to follow on and just played awkward. And because of some of the terms they had put in and not turning up to board meetings and sort of stuff like that, we ended up with the, the VC who was in that fund writing to the chairman of the holding company of that, that CVC saying, your investor director here is messing this business up. It's fine if you don't want to follow on, but please sign the documents so that the rest of us can follow on and do the investment. And I said that went to the to the chairman of the board of the holding company. And just imagine that coming back down through the organization of what the hell are you guys doing? And that was one of the case studies we did on our on our program, wasn't it? Neil, about boards behaving badly and those sorts of sorts of areas and that there. So when it's one of the cases in my in, in my book. It is uh, it is frequently the case in the US, for example, that um, because of the litigious nature um, and in my view, some slightly overcautious advice from some of our other law firms in this area, um, a number of uh, a number of corporate investors, when they invest, they won't take a board seat. They will um, 
have an observer seat. Now, famously, the famous um, Intel Capital, for the first um, several years of its life, would only take an observer role, thinking that that would reduce their liability in circumstances like this. Now, uh, in America, they don't have shadow director concept, I don't think. Um, but the um, but Intel five four or five years ago, Wendell, the new head of Intel Capital, when he came in, he changed that and said, "I want my investor director, uh, investor directors, to be active, to lean in, to use the Californian phrase, to participate, to mentor the CEO, to be alongside them in the trenches, to understand what best practice is when you're on the board." To understand you've got to act in the best interest of that company when making those decisions but take your board seat um now um evan for example is on um as he said earlier and so hopefully he doesn't mind me saying is is an observer on one of the companies where uh, we have a retainer and i'm in all of their board meetings if not all of them but um the key ones and um and so in those circumstances, that's clearly something that uh, that his company has decided is, uh, is is appropriate in those circumstances. Now, does it get you out of fiduciary duties? Yes, it does. Um, does it get you out of um, fiduciary duties if you behave as though you are a director? If you um, uh, if the board is habitually used to following your instruction as though you are a director? then are you a shadow director to the second part of your question now the, as an academic exercise paul um a lot of lawyers especially younger ones will argue this point all the time but in the i mean i started practicing in the early 90s so much longer than the 20 years that we were talking about earlier um I've never seen anybody have liability as a shadow director, and I've never heard of any of my friends that I trained with and grew up with as corporate lawyers who know any of their clients where anybody's ever had a um, liability as a shadow director. So I think it's an interesting academic point that you don't have in other countries. Uh, and it is one that I argue when observers are throwing their weight around, and I argue that they should either do the job properly or they should not be there and uh um and so the shadow director point is a gray area you've you've also got de facto directors etc and uh and a uh, you don't have to turn up to a board meeting to be a shadow director either paul i mean if for example one of these large um global corporations is telling the company what to do in every board meeting then they're more likely to be a shadow director than an observer who is participating properly. So, but again, I've never seen that actually that particular um, chicken coming home to roost uh, in practical terms. I don't know if Mark or Tim or Andrew have seen shadow directorship actually crystallizing. It's Mark a, cu a couple of times in you know where people were throwing things around to see what would stick to the wall in situations where, you know, a company was up against the wall, uh, funding needing to go in and people were blocking it. Um, so somebody who might not have been on the board, but had a shareholder veto right on new share issuances, but uh, you know, more than I've not seen it more than being talked about and threatened in a way that actually was taken forward in a meaningful way. And because I think the reason for that is, and, and you know, anybody who is a professional, investor that serves as a director in that capacity is unlikely to really behave in a way that is going to get them in that kind of trouble. Um, if I may, I might just go on to a related topic, which is, you know, what I advise in those circumstances, Paul, which is, which is when, when, when somebody asks me, um, I encourage them to take board seats, whether they're an investor. And so, you know, I listed some of my um, clients that I do investment deals for, and I'm, I advise them um uh always to take their board seat and when i'm acting on the portfolio company side i absolutely want the corporate investor to be a director um because i want them to be understanding what is best practice so those so on both sides i will be advising 
that they should take their board seats. Now, they, they, they might choose not to, or their stake might be too small, Paul, for them to have the bandwidth to do that. Because if you take a board seat, do it properly. And that's really the advice. The advice and sitting on the board is as follows. Follow best practice. Take advice, including what, a, what is a fiduciary duty, what isn't a fiduciary duty, and what circumstances can you do as you're told. Understand the law that applies. And Siri, if you're sitting on a board in the UK, uh, English law will apply. Um, if it's incorporated as an English, uh, a company incorporated in England and Wales, English law will apply. And even if the investment agreement is in US law, or the investment agreement can be in Norwegian law, but the company is incorporated in Germany, the law that applies is German. It's mandatory area of law when it comes down to fiduciary duties. Now, they're contractual points as well, and so two laws will apply. But know the law. Um, you don't have to know the law like we know the law, but, um, but know who to ask in what circumstances and uh, make sure that you've got, um, got somebody in that jurisdiction to advise you in circumstances where it's difficult. Because fiduciary duties law... Um, that we deal with globally, the US and all, com all, all English, British Commonwealth countries are common law jurisdictions derived from English law. But that's not the case in Norway. It's not the case in Germany and France, but they have fiduciary duties anyway. And in Germany, which I know a bit better than Norway, fiduciary duties are remarkably similar. The duties of care are very, very similar, even though contract law, securities law, all of these sorts of things, corporate law, are very different because it's a civil code jurisdiction and not a common law jurisdiction. It's because fiduciary duties are derived ultimately from Roman law. And so 90% of fiduciary duties and the director's best practice the world over are the same. But that 10% is a nuance that enables you to in be indemnified for more things in America than you can in the UK, certainly more than in Germany. And you should know that because in that um, residual 10%, the liability could arise. And understand which law applies. You don't have to study law, but um, understand which law applies. Avoid conflicts of interest. When your employer tells you to vote in a certain way sometimes the answer is you know what you have a veto um, you, but you turn up to the board meeting and it's in the best interest of the company for you to vote yes to something in the sure knowledge that your employer will veto it fine you have to understand in the board meeting you wear a different hat and when you're wielding the vetoes that is the investor you're not the investor you're a director so you can vote yes and no to the same thing yeah. you can vote yes yeah. at the board meeting and i was advising uh, the call before this one uh, on this very point to some colleagues in the us that might very well be required and that's actually why um some people will argue that the vetoes shouldn't be wielded by the investor director they should actually be um be a signature from somebody else now that isn't necessary but you've just got to understand how to avoid that conflict of interest the, the key image that's that was part of this um this talk was having you know the person striding between the cor corporate head office and then with their legs splayed over to the company they were an investor sort of in which is this sort of you're torn between your investor, your LP, and you being on the board. No, I was just going to say that that's um, that's really useful and interesting context, Neil. Thank you. And um, I think the idea of kind of voting yes with one hat and then no with the other hat on on the same thing is a, is a really important one. I guess the most obvious example that feels like it's you know likely to to arise. Um, is is future funding and and a corporate's um, appetite or ability to provide follow-on funding through current 
crisis um and that you know whether that's um because of the corporate's current position or because of you know underlying concerns around the the, the quality of the business prior to prior to the the, the covid-19 crisis but, but I, I guess managing um any insights you have on managing that specifically around uh, funding conversations where you may have a, a an investor director or a board observer where we we're, we're a uh, corporate maybe or, or investor maybe clear that they are not um, intending to provide follow-on funding, but but from the company's perspective, they clearly do need to raise funding and, and managing that um, potential conflict. Raised a, a very good point, not least because it's the, the issue that everybody is uh, calling us about at the moment, which is that a number of strategics at the moment, no names, uh, are uh, are looking to dispose of core asset, uh, non-core assets and sometimes core assets um, to concentrate this is what happens in in difficult times obviously for a, a lot of corporations they will say we've got to focus on uh, on cash flows today um, long-term investments um, divisions that are underperforming we've not made decisions about those sorts of things and and the venture fund will then very often fall into this now the Average longevity of a of a venture fund is only four years. The average longevity of a ten year LPG PP fund, obviously, is ten years, and uh, and so the strategy can often uh, be, come down from the uh, from the global corporation saying, not only are you're not going to make any new investments. That's the first thing, um, which is generally what is happening at the moment most of my clients are not um, doing new investments that they're not already uh, invested in are they the second one is are they going to follow where they are already an investor director and an investor um, and then thirdly a number are considering whether that venture fund is a non-core asset that they're going to dispose of even so strategies change and we we are realistic that the venture the decision makers on the venture fund are very often not the worldwide CEO of the global corporation, usually aren't, and so or, or they're told by the CFO or they're told by Treasury or they're told by their funders um, that they have to change their strategy. Now, when they were set up in the first place, if they had listened to Andrew or my advice when consulting on the formation at the beginning to be a long-term investor you need to be autonomous then you'll make those decisions on an autonomous basis not on a short-term basis because of the needs of the global corporation however that's easy for us to say that's not necessarily what's going to happen at the time so it is it is a it is a daily issue that we have today when um, when advising both sides of this, that most corporations don't particularly want to, most investor directors, fund managers in the corporate funds don't really want to go to their investment committees or their mothership, their LPs, to say, can I have some money today? Because they know that people have been furloughed and there are redundancies and divisions are being shut down. It's very, very difficult. Now, and provided you when you go to that board meeting, you are mindful that when you're in that board meeting, you are a director of that company. You should declare your interests that you are also representing, you have an employer, and you're representing your global corporation, but, um, but you can vote against uh, or in, in favor of your conscience. Um, uh, at the time. Now, it might be in the best interest of a company, for example, to appoint an administrator because you're right, you're not, you as investors are not able to fund that company going forward. But you as an investor might, or you're a strategic investor, you might have a, a license agreement with that company. You want them to survive. You don't want them to go into administration or you don't want them to go into administration yet or you might have a disagreement or the other way around. You might want them to go into administration. You want, might want to pick up the assets on the cheap. 
well that would be a massive conflict of interest and in those circumstances and that 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 is these are circumstances that are happening daily it's incredibly difficult to deal with um how you deal with that well um understand the roles that you are fulfilling and you can vote yes and no on the same topic with different capacities the, having the lp being a corporate where the head office has said no we've got to furlough people and we're cutting people then that's going to stop that investor following on in this in this round but you as managing the fund as you said or as a director you have different interests around doing those sort of things part of the part of the way of managing that uh, interest that is so directly conflicting is is to take advice and a couple of other practical things so not just um, generic but practical things that you should do today the first is check the DNO insurance and everybody says oh yeah of course you know the company has DNO insurance um, as investors I bet you all will tell the companies that you invest in exactly what sort of key man insurance they should have and you will also require the company to get dno insurance but i guarantee that you have never read the dno insurance so i had a company that um i do restructurings as well because of the sector i cover uh, i had and, and i put it into liquidation uh, and it was a hundred million dollar might even have been pounds, 100 million pounds um, uh, liquidation. And the liabilities were 100 million pounds greater than the asset. The DNO insurance was 5 million. And the excess was a quarter of a million pounds. So, Paul, how would you like to? Uh, deal with the first quarter of a million pounds yourself, in other words. Why do people insist on what the key man insurance looks like, but not the DNO insurance? So the DNO insurance needs to be adequate. Um, the DNO insurance really needs to cover you. If you're being, if you are appointed by Aviva onto the board of a company that goes into insolvency, who has the deep pockets? It will be assumed by people that your employment contract indemnifies you when you sit on the board of a portfolio company but again you might not have checked that point um you might no. also be have an indemnity so in the us all funds in the us pretty much will ask for the investor director to be indemnified by the portfolio company but what happens if it's in liquidation you've got an indemnity from a company in liquidation and does the indemnity work against breach of fiduciary duties? Well, probably not. And so that indemnity also needs to be given by your employer. And, and that is actually very often the case, not the case. Your employment contract might not even allow you to sit on boards. So you should also check your insurance contract. You should check whether you are indemnified by your employer and that they will cover your legal costs. Yeah. Neil, can I can I t take on another sort of question, which which was always which was always one that um, when we were doing the academies, always struck people was got, was quite impactful. And I again had a similar experience with, when when I was just advising this this business I was with. You know, the business can run out of cash, and the founders and the the, the other founders and that in this business got all excited about the government saying they're going to give this loans and that to the businesses and they immediately sort of went off thinking they could, they could get these loans and i said look guys putting more debt onto the business does not solve the problem that i think you're going to be insolvent and i don't want to be a director on an insolvent business as you sort of highlighted could you explain that to people about this insolvency uh, side of it? Because you explain it a lot better than I managed to explain to others, even though I've sat through your sort of times. But if you could give an explanation about what Absolutely. you need to look out for with that. Absolutely. So there are only two ways of uh, any company staying in business in the long term, profits or equity. And you'll notice I didn't mention debt. So profits for the innovator company are down the track. They're not, um, they're not valuable because of their positive EBITDA necessarily today. Some software companies are, but a lot of the hard hard tech that you're investing in 
and to not fall into those categories. So they're not profitable and they can't become profitable by letting a division go and becoming profitable. Um, so they, yeah, they have to raise equity. Uh, however, companies actually close, the timing of a company closing will be a cash flow issue. Now, uh, lawyers will understand and will point out that there are two limbs of the definition of insolvent. First limb is you can't pay creditors as they fall due on a cash flow basis. And the second is a balance sheet basis. Are the liabilities greater than the assets? And both of them will trigger banking covenants, et cetera. But it's cash flow that is key. Cash flow can be fixed with debt, but it it makes worse the balance sheet. On the day, it's neutral because assets go up a million, liability goes up a million. But as you consume that cash, the liability is still there. So debt can only be short term. And it needs to be on benign terms. And the uh, the future fund debt, for example, I am advising clients, even those with insolvent balance sheets, to in in the right circumstances, not in all circumstances. Yes, Andrew, to take debt. I'd prefer it if they had equity, but the future fund, uh, twelve months, uh, no interest uh, payment. So it gives you twelve months worth of some cash. It's matched funding. Uh, the coupon is 8%, so it's not too bad. It's unsecured, so it doesn't get in the way of, um, of other investments. So it's reasonably benign. Um, and it converts on a convertible basis automatically into a qualifying round at a discount of 20%. So in other words, it's market. And so in those circumstances, and there has to be a really good reason, Andrew, to take debt, that probably is a good reason because a lot of the companies that I'm working with have got to say uh, have got to survive the summer. Now, some yeah. companies raise money at Q1, and they're happy days for 18 months, and they can get through this. Those that were looking to raise money in Q4 would be starting looking for their money today, and that's much more difficult. And so, drawing down under on the future fund. Um, unsecured, benign, relatively benign debt for a smaller amount of money is actually, uh, with if you take advice, is perfectly within the fiduciary duties of the directors to draw down on the, on that credit. But most of the time, debt compounds um, these issues and it doesn't fix it. And that future fund money does not fix it unless you raise a qualifying round yeah, yeah. Neil, that's another way some equity neil it's mark, mark. I, and you know you and i have talked about this it, it seems like from what you we can read that the actual money that has gone out under the other loan programs from the uk government not the future fund which isn't operating yet have been pretty limited in part because the banks that are on the front line don't seem to want to make those loans probably because they don't like the credit risk of what they're seeing. And so yeah. there seems to be a real issue in there uh, contrasting that uh, the program in the United States, which is different, but at least one aspect of it is a, a big part of the loans have the, the purpose is to keep people in their jobs in simple terms. This is the PPP program in the US. And if you do what you're supposed to do and you take that money, it turns into a grant. And from what we have seen, the banks are easier to deal with because at the end of the day, they don't have to worry about, in most cases, getting the money back. But it, it it's kind of a different point than it takes us on to the bailout program. And, and but I, I think a lot of companies have spent a lot of time, I guess my point is, thinking about accessing these government loans and the money just doesn't seem to be flowing and the future fund hasn't happened yet. So we're... we're I, I'd very much agree with yeah, that. Yeah, that's now. absolutely right. The C-bills the C -bills program, I think only 2 to 3% um, of the announced money. So the, the UK government announced per head of population more money than the US, but in the US they capped it at 4% interest. One of our clients, the uh, most of our clients didn't didn't apply for reasons mark um and, and andrew's point doesn't help you on a solvency basis but the banks came back for one of our uh clients actually it's, it's the company we act for the investor 
And they came back and they said interest rates of more than 20 percent and personal guarantees from all of the investors, including yeah, yeah. the investors. That's directors. pretty good. So can you imagine Ant uh, saying, OK, yeah, personal guarantee I'll give for, for the companies that I'm on the board of? Of course not. So that that is the equivalent of a bank saying, no, I don't want to lend. And that's the problem with with that sort of debt. So the terms really matter. And in the US, um, they um, do have uh, they've announced per head of population a smaller sum. But virtually all the companies that I know that qualify because it's benign, it's 4 percent interest. But you don't have to pay any interest whatever because it's forgiven. It's turned into a grant. If at the end of this process, you uh, you still employ all of your employees. So it's a exactly what is designed to do which is to preserve the employment so um different different um countries have done it in a different way the swiss uh you make an application and you can and your it's in your bank account that day i understand um now woe betide you if you have misled um anybody because um that's a criminal offense and um, they really will enforce that but um here we've delegated it wholly to the banks and um, the banks have not uh, been terribly keen. They haven't politically. They haven't said no to anybody or very many people because they'll be in political hot water. So they've done the equivalent, asked for personal guarantees, and they know that nobody's going to say yes. Country is that because the UK is effectively um, that scheme is only eighty percent guaranteed by the government, and so the banks are taking on you know still twenty percent. Of, uh, of of the risk in effect and is that is that different in, in other in, countries yeah it is it's different in switzerland and germany where there's a hundred percent guarantee and and the chancellor announced that it would be a hundred percent guaranteed here but the problem here is only that in part um it's also that there's a that there's a hundred percent delegation to the to the banks to set terms so they can set any interest rate they like now, that's not the case in other jurisdictions where the interest rate is capped at a low level. Um, so that's why you end up with, you know, companies that should have debt already will already be banked and have a revolving credit facility, etc. And that's why there's been so little take up. Um, so so it's um, it, it's actually not been structured um, uh, properly. So I'm hoping that it will be restructured. I'm actually hoping that the next announcement will be a relaxation of, of, uh, of well, a stimulation on the equity side and not just the debt. Yeah, finance. So I was going through this during March, um, and then when we closed this round at the, at the beginning of April. So when the when the CEO was the scenario I said earlier, sort of said, "Oh, we're gonna we, we could get this from the bank," and I said, "Look." I, I did a study a few years back uh, looking at what the government tried to do to do debt for IP rich businesses. And they ended up putting sort of cheap loans or these sort of guaranteed sort of type loans for IP business. And what we found when we spoke to the banks was the, the banks just shifted debt that they put in to businesses when they were fully risked. They said, oh, we'll now shift that to now being partly covered by the government. And I think they're even cautious now to even take on the 20 percent risk that that was sort of pointed out and that, and that earlier. Um, and, and I say reiterating the point that, you know, the reason we got onto this sort of subject is just putting debt onto the balance sheet does not solve your sort of problem. And I, and I think sitting on the board of a business like Paul is, like some of you are, it's a difficult decision to have with that, that with the board and with the business to say, hey, guys, you're an enthusiastic CEO and founder, and of course you think you're going to make sales, and of course you think this is only going to last six months. But I'm looking at you now, and I think you're insolvent, and therefore I've got to act, or we've got to act, and we've got to raise equity, or we've got to be in the we've got to know that we can furlough staff to get the runway running longer, or, or we've got to make a yeah. decision. You know, as as Neil said, yes, if you can get benign terms. And you can get for the debt long enough, and you really believe that the business can trade out of this, then fine. But at some point, you've got to make that call. Is that fair? Neil? Yeah. As Andrew says, that when you're making a decision as to whether something is insolvent, you uh, you will be having uh, more regular board meetings. You ought to be having more regular board meetings. You ought to be having board calls at the moment, obviously, um, uh, on a weekly basis. You need to have 
cash flows from your CFO on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. You need to know which payments of creditors you are permitted to make that isn't a preference. So in other words, a reversible antecedent transaction if the company goes into insolvency, which you as a director can be personally liable for, you have to avoid preferences. So you can't prefer one creditor over another unless there's a good reason for that. And there are good reasons often because you might need supplies. You pay a million pounds to a supplier and they supply something for a million pounds and you turn it into 10 million pounds on the uh, on the uh, way out of your warehouse, then that is worth doing. If you are obliged by the Insolvency Act and the Companies Act to take legal advice, then guess what? You can pay us. Um, I'm very pleased to say, um, and you are obliged, and you are obliged to, to take advice um, in those circumstances. That's not a preference. So you do have to be mindful as a director because you have personal liability for getting this uh, badly wrong. Um, on preferences, undervalues. So in other words, just before you go into insolvency, you can't give away an asset at an undervalue because a liquidator will then say, hey, in the six months prior, the first thing a liquidator does is he looks at, uh, he or she looks at antecedent transactions. So any deals which might be one, a preference to a creditor, two, an undervalue transaction. And that can be a license of, of IP um or a an extortionate credit transaction which is the one that everyone forgets but right now that is you know 22 percent interest rate from a, a bank taking security personal guarantees is that an extortionate credit transaction pretty bloody extortionate if you ask me um so in those circumstances those are the three things a liquidator looks at first first day and so you've got to be very careful especially about paying creditors now, if those creditors are secured creditors that can enforce their security, it's slightly different. And it's a topic for another day as to exactly when you can pay a creditor, when you can't pay a creditor. But you need to pay attention to that. Andrew said that you make a decision as to whether the company is insolvent. Well, sometimes it's a grey area. And as I described, company the timing of a company insolvency, in other words, appointment of an administrator, receiver, a liquidator sometimes the creditors make take that timing out of your hands receivers are appointed by the venture holders administrators are appointed by creditors or directors but mostly directors and liquidators like like likewise so in those circumstances when are you appointing a liquidator or administrator well you do it on a cash flow basis but you can't do it on a cash flow basis when you've run out of money you have to look at the wind down costs as well so how much do the employees cost on a notice period basis? What are the break fees on your contracts? What are the notice periods on your contracts, for example? What are those creditor balances? It's not enough to be flying your plane and it, until the moment it falls out of the sky because for want of fuel, you're obliged to stop somewhere to refuel at the last possible moment, maybe, but after that, that's when you appoint an administrator, sadly, not when you've run out of fuel. Yeah, great point. That'll be a quote for the next one, Neil. You were picking up quotes from Tony. That I think that's a great one to pick up on that from you when you run out, run out of fuel. In the context of a, you've referenced the PPP and uh, other sort of public funding that's available in the current environment. Uh, how? What advice would you have for us on how to handle a situation where you have a mix of different investors in the company who have different views on whether public funding should be taken or not, uh, and how to navigate that situation when you could have people like ourselves who uh, are considered to be sort of deeper pocketed individuals uh, and then you may also have sort of uh, smaller financial funds who may not have uh, or private investors who won't have the uh, same sort of reputational aspects to consider when considering whether to apply for public funding in the current environment. Thanks. This is coming up um, a lot, and uh, and sometimes it's it's the other way around. Sometimes it's not the uh, 
large corporate just because they have the large balance sheet. It, it, sometimes it's the large corporate that doesn't want to invest. Um, and uh, uh, moving away from non-core uh, assets, which sadly some corporates will see the venture funds in that category and not support follow-on rounds. And so, yeah, this is happening um, quite a lot. So the first thing to, to say in keeping with with all of the remarks today is um, is that the there's a separation of the decision as a director in the board meeting where you have to act in the best interest of that company. And, and that decision might be to draw down, um, if they're benign, uh, government soft loans, for example, convertible loans that aren't secured, where you don't have to pay interest for a while, that helps on the cash flow front. If you've got a reasonable expectation of raising equity in that period, then it is probably a good idea in most circumstances to try to find that match funding. Um, other people might not have the wherewithal or the interest to invest. Now that is a different question and it's a different capacity. And so those, those conversations can be in the same meeting, but please explain to everybody when you are uh, speaking that, um, that you are speaking now with a different capacity. It is best practice to do that outside a board meeting. Now, it's not practical to do that sometimes. A good chairman will, and if I were um, there, as I am within some of the boards um, for the corporates that, uh, that I advise, I'll, I'll be in those board meetings. Then in those circumstances, then the lawyer can intervene and say, well, actually, you know, it's better um, for the minutes for this to be off the minutes. It's a conversation qua investor. And, it's, and then you're not um, uh, it's not a grey area as to your fiduciary duties. Um, you might have missed at the beginning, we were explaining that you can vote for something as a director and then veto it. It's perfectly logical to, to have different capacities and in each of those capacities, you make a dis different decision. For the benefit of others, another aspect or another element of how we deal with this is, uh, internally is we have a separation of duties as to who holds the director role and who uh, controls the shareholder responsibilities. And so depending on what the uh, issue being considered is, if it's a director issue, it goes to the director, but if it's a shareholder investor issue, it goes to a different person to uh, decide. I wish everybody would follow best practice like that because that is absolutely bang on. A couple more remarks, if I may. Um, in the context of, we were talking about the best interests of the company and uh, most people uh, we'll repeat that. All of you that sit on boards will know that you have to act in the best interests of the company. But few people ask what that means until it becomes confused. Uh, and in insolvency terms, it does become confused because the best interests of the company have for hundreds and hundreds of years as common law until it was codified in the Companies Act 2006. The best interests of the company was the company has um, the interests first, the interests as a whole of the shareholders. So as a whole, not your shareholder, but interests of the shareholders as a whole. Now, as you know, in the Companies Act 2006, which actually came into, act, into force in 2009, the, there's also a list of others that you could take into account, stakeholders, creditors, employees, etc. cetera. Um, and those are a part mandatory part voluntary but it's shareholders as a whole um, and not your appointer now that's something you all know however if you're in the twilight zone of insolvency so you're in this situation as andrew said you're you're you might or might not be insolvent you might have triggered one test but not the other you might have enough cash you might have enough cash to last to raise equity and should you continue when you're in the twilight zone which is what all practitioners call it. Um, if you're in that twilight zone, your first duty when acting in the best interests of the company is no longer to the shareholders. It's to the creditors. And your 
you're a pointer is not a creditor typically you might have a loan you might be a creditor but generally you're a shareholder you now have no interests when you're making your decision as to what is in the best interest of the company you then have to make the um on top of the shareholders is creditors and those creditors interests then um will be be guiding you as to that decision if you don't follow um, that guidance, you will be in breach of your fiduciary duties. It's different when you're in the twilight zone. So in the twilight zone, yeah. creditors first. Um, as, a, as a quote directly from the Insolvency Act, you have to take every step to minimise losses to creditors. Now, anybody familiar with English law knows that it's very unusual for English law to say, say every. It normally says reasonable or every step to minimize losses to creditors are you taking every step to minimize losses to creditors and that might mean raise a bit of cash flow on the future fund to do it there's got to be a bloody good reason and does it minimize in your reasonable assessment um is it uh, a reasonable assessment that it is every step to minimize losses to creditors and then for you to decide that you are continuing to trade, your defense to wrongful trading is, and I quote again, a reasonable expectation of being able to avoid insolvent liquidation. If you don't have a reasonable expectation of being able to avoid insolvent liquidation, even in a year, you close today. And every board meeting to cover your legal position, there's no law against being a director of an insolvent company there are laws against um uh being negligent taking unreasonable decisions not taking advice obviously fraudulent and in america for example personal liability will accrue if you're fraudulent but not necessarily in other circumstances but in the uk you have to have a reasonable expectation that you can avoid insolvent liquidation and if you do not have that in any board meeting which now as discussed we're now in weekly board meetings or weekly board calls you need to pass that resolution each week and if you pass that resolution each week the law will not second guess that decision unless it is ridiculous um but pass that resolution and minute it and as discussed you'll have had the cash flows from your cfo you'll have an update from your execs you'll make that decision and you'll pass a resolution and if um you know you should take advice from insolvency practitioners will always take a pre-appointment role we're working with all the big four and grant thornton and others on pre-appointment roles right now where they're advising boards as am i um, and tim and mark um on their pre uh, on that twilight zone the nuance as to whether or not you have a reasonable expectation in these circumstances of avoid, avoiding insolvent liquidation. I'd like to move it on slight, slightly forward as well, uh, Neil. We've discussed now about the business is about to go bankrupt and liabilities and, and whether the, the a, a investment is going to be made by the corporate. You've discussed this twilight zone. One of the areas that I'm working in at the moment is how do we come out of this? And I think there's a, a discussion maybe to have here in terms of director's role, as you just touched on, about the interests and in that of the company. And also the broader things here in terms of you've talked about how creditors are important. But then what about employees and what about customers? And now coming out of this, um, one of my businesses at the moment is getting face masks from China. And the discussion we're having with companies about should your staff and should your customers be wearing face masks? And what are the processes when you start coming out of this and you ask the employees to come back to work into the office, into the factory, and you start dealing with other, you know, with other people coming onto your site? And it's really interesting, and I'm sure some of the people on the call here, I know some of the corporates that I work with, it's a disciplinary issue if you don't hold the handrail when you're walking around the offices and around the factory. What is the situation now I'd raise with you as directors in your startups and in your corporate? What is your situation now as a director in making the decision for responsibly opening the business and putting your staff and your customers and your suppliers at risk? 
there's with this situation we've got all these layers of health and safety on here as well which you know that it's a slightly different topic than what we started this on from an investment side but when you're sitting as a director on a, on the board of some of these startups and the reputational risk which was partly questioned earlier around health and safety is maybe a more more of an issue than even the the the, the liquidation sort of point i think it's a great point about the reputational side of this because um habitually there are areas of law insolvency being being a key one where there's personal liability for the directors and the investor directors there, there generally won't be in the circumstances of um of the employees coming back to work and making a particular decision as a board that they'll come back to work and if there's not ppe whether you have personal liability typically there wouldn't be um now there might be some personal liability that um, um, there might be some areas of health and safety in some jurisdictions where there is personal liability for directors, um, but in these circumstances there typically wouldn't be. Or th three of the biggest companies in the world, then you are you have reputational uh, risks associated with that, which is why uh, have a health and safety uh, and environmental um, uh, schedule. You might have. Um, governance schedules that are key from a reputational point of view that you see as just as important as any uh, as any other clause in your contracts. Um, you, you might now have to deal with a slightly different health issue. The first, the first one we did in this series actually was with Olivia Garrell, who is head of Unilever Ventures, and one of the interesting aspects he talked about there is because they've got. 50 investments globally, 30% of them in Asia, 50% in the States and 20% in Europe. He was saying what they were able to do was the learnings that came from Asia where this hit first and they've got different control measures were able to share that within their business um, and within their portfolio so that the Americans could learn and the Europeans could learn of what this cash situation, the process situation, the health and safety sort of it situations. So that so they being on the board of their startups was able to share that so those sort of insights and dealing with this across a lot of the aspects we talked about today and that as well. So we can we can probably make that um, some of the insights from Olivia available as well. Uh, a really fruitful discussion, and and I really uh, appreciate you taking time to set up the event and and neil for for all your guidance and, and information i think i thought it was great free to go back and look at um the eventbrite site and and sign up for those and we really appreciate your contributions questions and all that we've had today so um neil thank you very much uh, is there any final words on that from you i was just going to offer um to everybody there's a there's a checklist that uh, that i've handed out after andrew's events in the past it's a one page checklist universal to all jurisdictions um, that as an investor director that you can go down it, it, most of the topics covered today apart from the COVID um, related ones but uh, most of the topics today are on that checklist it, it's predominantly for when you start as an investor director but it covers indemnification and DNO insurance that um, you're now hopefully going to go off or get your in-house lawyers to uh, go off and look at and um, and so if anybody wants a copy of that one page checklist, they can email me. I'm nfoster at brownrudnick.com. Thank you all very much for your contribution. Uh, I think the, you know, the value of this is having your questions and your and the discussion of that from you as well, rather than just being a broadcast. So thank you very much for your contribution all as well. And um, look forward to meeting you all again. Feel free to get in touch with me if um, there's any aspects you want to follow up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Really good. Really thank you. Thank you for joining us and do subscribe to the podcasts or to the videos and look at aim of our resources. Feel free to drop us an email or a message and be very happy to, to follow up. Thank you.